if you yeah. could just they've got a board meeting out there i've probably got 15 minutes i'm gonna start getting this ready to get to the can board you spend board. about three and sit there and, and recount yeah how you drove up there and parked and use so a road i'm just saying if i start kind of hurry to tell them hey the the day day from, just identify yourself by name and where you're your okay. And what was your name? Happened. Okay. Uh, my name is Bill. Bill I was uh, stationed in the Air Force at Holman Air Force Base from 1954 to 56. Uh, in 1950, uh, late 1954 and 55, I met my uh, soon-to-be wife after that uh, in church in Almogordo, and through her, I met my Future father in law, Alf, his name is Mr. Jarbo on one. AJ Gillis. I can cut it off. Cut it off. Okay. And uh, he was the electrical engineer for the rocket sled. And uh, that was at that time being conducted uh, at Holland Air Force Base. His background was geology, but in those days, you couldn't make much money as being a geologist, so therefore he uh, spent his time being a geologist on weekends, then being a geologist on weekends, roaming the country, uh, piling up piles of rocks, filing claims, uh, being the old-time prospector, which we all dream about and like to do, he actually did. Um, later in, uh, I can't remember the date, but I'll say it was in 57, uh, it seemed like it was probably about July or August of 1957. Okay. He and another okay. partner, a friend of his, that would go out and okay. explore and uh, uh, file mineral claims. And his name was J.L. Woods. And uh, they were over in the father in law's house, and my wife and I were there that evening. And he invited me uh, to go down to the Rocket Lounge in Alamogordo to visit a gentleman that had a bar of gold in the showing. And uh, supposedly it came from, he said, over toward Las Cruces. And at that time, I didn't know uh, Victoria Peak from any other peak or anything else. It didn't mean anything to me. Uh, most of my exploration and wanderings that I did with him was in the Almogordo, White Oaks, Hickorias, uh, or Brandy, Areas like that, more on the east side, I guess, of the White Sands Valley than over on the uh, west side. So I didn't get to go that night. And my wife had something else come up, and uh, the next day I asked my father in law what he thought about uh, the gold if they got to see it. He said, Yes, the uh, gentleman he met with uh, had one bar that he showed him that was about a 50 or 60 pound bar. And um, it looked to be a real gold. I asked him if it was pure, and he said, no, he didn't think it was. It was like what he called a dory bar. To me, at those days, I didn't know what a dory bar was. And I asked him what the size was, and he said it was probably about the size of a brick, maybe a little bit larger, but close to the size of a brick. And um, that was the first time I've ever heard of anybody really seeing a real gold bar. I'm from Kentucky, and this was all new to me. Um, while I had panned gold and I had seen raw silver and gold that he had pointed out to me in the ground, I never seen anything like that. So uh, I really didn't think any more about it until later in November of 1962. Uh, at that time, I was living in San Antonio and I had gone back to El Mogoro to visit my in laws for Thanksgiving. Uh, on the day after Thanksgiving, my father-in-law asked me if I would like to take a little ride with him over toward Las Cruces. That he had a, he called it a cave, that he wanted to explore and he wanted me to go along in case anything happened. So I went with him in his car, which happened to be, uh, I would say, a 1948 Studebaker Commander. Uh, which he had fixed up like an old Jeep, and he drove like a Jeep. It had big, heavy uh, tires on it, and uh, uh, numerous plies, probably a six-ply tire with looked more like mud tires or snow tires than did anything else. And that vehicle would climb like a gold almost anything. So 
best I can remember, we went over and we got off the road and we came to an opening, which was, I would say, more like a, a cattle fence, just a couple of strings of barbed wire. And there was a, like an old barbed wire gate, like going through there. And uh, there was a 2MP sitting there in, in a Jeep at the time. And they would ask us where we were going, and my father-in-law told them that he had some property up on the mountains and claims up there, and we were going to go uh, exploring. And he also showed him his top secret pass because he worked on a rocket sled and would have top secret clearance uh, through civil service. So um, they said, we'll go on. They didn't say why they were there, why they stopped us, or nothing else, but we went on. Uh, I really can't remember how far we went uh, up the mountain. All I can remember is uh, vaguely, I remembered uh, that he pointed out a, uh, an old corral, which was unique to me. Uh, he would explain how they built these and where the people came from and this is how they cared for the cattle, etc. I also remember a, uh, a rock, small rock house and he mentioned something about... You remember passing the springs with yeah. the pictographs? Yeah, we went through a, a, a canyon, trees. more like a canyon, I guess. It was narrow. Yeah, it was narrow, a canyon. Like. Several trees. And there was trees there with uh, the springs and, and Indian markings. Uh, on the side, which so you were coming up in Bellow Canyon from the east. I didn't know what it was called, but yeah, that's what from the east. And uh, we went through there, and then we, I remember the uh, corrals, I remember the rock house, and, and basically that's about all I can remember as far as any markings or anything. And, and I cannot remember those being on the way to where we're going, or if he went out of the way to show me that, I, I don't remember. I just remember vaguely that he pointed out to me. Because stuff like that was really interesting to me due to the fact I'm from Kentucky and an Easterner never seen anything like that. It was uh, unique and I paid attention. I guess that's why I remember that. Um, we went out as far, I don't know if the car could climb any further or not. It was kind of a makeshift road. It really wasn't a road per se. Uh, we would go in and out of the cactus and the cacti and around rocks and he was kind of picking his way till he found this one place that the car probably came within, I'd say, maybe 20 feet, 30 feet of this ledge. It kind of had a, uh, uh, maybe a four foot rock wall or ledge. I just remember this kind of a small bluff or ledge like, and it was a kind of a dark place underneath. I don't know if he had pawed uh, cacti and brush over to what it was. I just know that he knew where he was going. When you left the road, do you know when you went to the left or the right? It seemed like to me it went left, that's what I can recall. And uh, I really wasn't paying that much attention, but it seemed like it was left. We were going right and left all the time, back and forth and stuff, <laughs> and it seems like to me when we stopped, we had gone left. Um, he got the car as close to this place as he could, tied a rope on it, and it had this rather long rope. It had a lot of knots in it at the time. And he said he was going down, he called into a cave. Uh, in the side of the mountain, and he said he'd been wanting to explore it. He'd heard a lot of uh, things about this area, and he wanted to go down there and see what he could find. It. And he had a uh, small military shovel with him, and a uh, flashlight, and a couple other ropes, and uh, basically that was about it. And well, what we did is we tied the rope on the bumper of the car, and I stayed up and prevent anything happened to him, I had to pull him out that I could back the car up and we found a safe place to back up, make sure there any rocks behind us so if I had to pull out. Uh, he was down probably 20, 30 minutes in the uh, hole and uh, I could hear him shoveling and digging and stuff like that and then he hollered said, well, I think I've got something here, won't you throw me down the rope? And uh, so I threw him down the rope and when I did, uh, I pulled up an object. I didn't know what it was. It was fairly heavy. And I'll encrust it with uh, dirt and what have you. And I started knocking it off. And he said, throw it back down. I got something else here. So I threw it down. And as we were knocking off the stuff later, after he came up, uh, we found that we had two uh, pretty good sized pitchers. Uh, they, I don't know what they weigh in there. Can you hold those on the table? Yeah, they're probably. Uh, nine or ten pounds a piece. I know they're about uh, 11 or 12 inches tall and about nine inches in diameter. Here are the pictures. Uh, this one right here appears to be an excellent 
condition. It's got a few rough places on it. It's got uh, some kind of Aztec-like engraving at the bottom. And evidently it had some kind of Cupid doll or something at the top. It's Ooh. gone. It did have a, a lid somehow fixed to this, but at one time or another uh, it's been removed. The other one has... It's doing a video picture. Oh! That's all right. <laughs> we uh, have here uh, the other picture, which in turn has a little dial or something on it. And it is unique to the fact that it does have a little hinge in here. It looks like it's been welded or soldered uh, crudely on it. It has, again, like uh, some kind of Aztec engravings all around the bottom, and it is more rusted out. Mm -hmm. Now, these. Any dates or anything on it? Anyway? No, I couldn't find any dates or anything on it. And uh, there's nothing else. We've gone completely over them. We've uh, attempted to clean them. I've used uh, silver polish. Uh, gone from one end to the other, and I can't find anything like that on them. I have had them uh, tested, and they've told me they're silver and silver plate. I don't know. Now, this is what a jeweler told me, friend. It's what he thought. He said part of this was pure silver from the weight. The other part, when he like that, he said it's a real thin silver plate or maybe pure silver, he wasn't sure. I didn't want to test it or put acids or anything on it uh, that run it. But when it shines up like this one does, it, when you leave the weight, they feel like they're pure silver. But they are quite heavy. Yes. So. Very heavy. Yeah. I'd say they're what? Yeah, nine, something's ten. broken off here. Yeah, this is where I think there's another one of these ornaments uh -huh. that was broken off. So it's just a few remains there. Similar to each other, even though the handles are Complete different. This one kind of goes up and uh, comes back around. Well, this one is more ornate in its design. They both evidently had a uh, some kind of a dial or something on it. Uh, this one is kind of recessed where this one comes up, so they're different that way. The lids, this is more ornate on the spout, or this is more of a plain pitcher like type of a. A spout, even though it's real ornate underneath and it has all the um, engraving and stuff here and all this matches and engraved at the top. Um, this one isn't quite as pronounced in the engravings, but it's more ornate up here at the top. And uh, this is what we got out. So by that time, it was time we got to the uh, hole, it was probably. Oh, 3.30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, I know it was late, and the time he got these up and he came back out, it was probably 5 o'clock and getting dark in November, and uh, we didn't want to stay up there on the side of the mountain, and it got too dark, so we started down. And these, like I said, you couldn't really tell what they were, except they were too big, heavy objects. We had uh, knocked off part of the dirt, we could tell there was some kind of silver ornaments or pictures, we weren't sure. And when we got home that night, I cleaned them up, knocked the dirt and dust off, and found out what the And he gave you no explanation as to how he knew they might be in that hole? No, he, he just told me that he had a hole up there that looked interesting that he wanted to explore. It's wonderful how he knew to, to dig in the bottom of the hole. I had no idea. I don't know if he went to the side, he went to the bottom. I don't know if there's a cave in there. I don't know how far down he went. Uh, the plan was to come back later. Yeah, he and I were all, pl we had plans to go back. This was uh, Thanksgiving. This weekend. Thanksgiving, 1962. We planned to go back on Christmas. I was living in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I came back out Christmas of 1962, and we were going to go down the day after Christmas as I took two weeks vacation. And he said he wanted to go back up there and explore uh, this cave. Is what he kept referring to. So I, I know it's more than a hole where he would kept referring to as a cave. Uh, he said he felt like this was probably a hiding place that somebody had. Maybe the Indians were after or something, and maybe they'd hid their treasure in there or something, and he wanted to go up there and dig some more to see what else we could find. And he was always, anytime he found a hole, he was always digging and exploring. So we had an unfortunate incident happen on Christmas Day. He was 54 years old, excellent health. And uh, Christmas Day, about 10 o'clock in the evening, while I was watching news, he had a stroke and uh, passed away the next day. So we never had the opportunity to go back. And, I didn't go back because I didn't think I could find or locate the place again. And uh, I knew I wasn't about to crawl down that hole, so <laughs> I, I was wasting my time unless I found somebody else to go with me to dig, go into the yeah. hole. 
Uh, I get claustrophobia when I go underground. Yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. I uh, hope it can be some help to somebody and they get something out of here. I hope so too. Uh, I know.